Hey guys, this is our chapter 56 lecture notes. Um, going to be a lot of skipping in this chapter. Uh, I think I mentioned before, a lot of this I think is pretty straightforward. It's, it's information, which like a lot of things, you read it, you remember it. I think it's, it's pretty easy to understand. Um, so I'm going to highlight a few things, but like, like I said, don't, don't be surprised if there is a substantial amount of skippage. So let's pull up the PowerPoint. There we go. And so as you can see, conservation and restoration, well, conservation biology and restoration ecology is the topic here. So this chapter focuses mainly on how we humans are attempting to restore ecosystems back to the a more natural state, uh, limit our expansion and, and through the environment and habitat destruction, and try to conserve as many species as we can. Uh, it may not seem like it to some people, but having a very biodiverse planet is important to us for many reasons. So here we go. I always thought this was interesting too. Uh, almost 2 million named species right now on the planet. Um, <laughs> we believe there's possibly up to 200 million more species that mostly have gone unnamed. So a lot of these are most likely bacterial, microorganisms, insects, uh, but, but certainly a lot of larger scale organisms as well. Um, as we continue to destroy tropical rainforest, acreage, uh, it's, it's kind of unnerving to think how many species are maybe gone forever that we didn't even know existed with us here on the planet. So like I said, conservation biology, trying to conserve as much as we can, and restoration ecology, bringing ecosystems back to a more natural state. So in the last chapter, we talked about several human activities that were detrimental to the environment uh, and for a lot of reasons. And the result of several of those uh, is the loss of species, species extinction, and a loss of biodiversity. So you can see biodiversity can be spoken of at the genetic level, the species level, and even at the ecosystem level. So this little graphic, I think, underscores that. You've got genetic variability in a population. You've got many different types of species in a community in, in a particular ecosystem versus ecosystem diversity, where you have different types of habitats uh, existing over a relatively uh, small expanse of area. So each level of diversity is important in the grand scheme of things. So a couple of terms, organisms, and I told you there'd be a lot of skipping. One of the things to keep in mind, uh, a lot of our prescription drugs that we all, you know, as, as humans love so much, uh, have their origins in various plant species. So again, it gets back to that, the more tropical rainforest uh, and just habitat in general that we destroy, you know, what potential medications are we missing out on uh, due to these species being gone forever? And it's not just plants, it's microorganisms, animals, uh, but, but certainly a lot have come directly from plants. With a loss of diversity means a loss of genes which is kind of taking the fuel away from the fire of evolution. So, you know, you can only go with what you have. So if these genes are lost and taken out of a population, they're unavailable to mutate and to change and to maybe lead to adaptations in that species. So it really is a, a big picture bad thing all around. Little list of things that 
ecosystems do for us as far as purification, detoxification, nutrient cycling, uh, certainly everything worth, worth keeping. And we said this, habitat destruction due to human overpopulation is a huge factor in really all the bad things that are happening. Now, we will talk about introduced species, also known as invasive species, uh, which we have touched on before, and overexploitation. You know, it is amazing to me that there's still really any fish left in the ocean. I mean, when you think about how much we harvest on a daily basis, I mean, I know the oceans are enormous and, and there is a huge biomass there, but it's incredible to me when you see the millions of, of individuals taken worldwide on a daily basis, it's incredible that reproduction uh, can keep up. And I think that's the problem. It can't keep up, which is why we are over exploiting these resources. All right. So introduce species. Basically, when you take a species native to one area and bring it into another, um, in its original area, there were predators, there were checks and balances. You bring it into a new area, sometimes across the planet, there's no predators, maybe there's no parasites and so forth, pathogens that would limit its growth and its spread. Uh, it outcompetes local species and destroys diversity in, in short time. Um, the snakehead fish is an example brought over from Southeast Asia. Um, these fish reproduce like crazy. They eat everything in, in their environment. Um, they have no natural predators in most areas here. Uh, so they are overtaking lakes, big lake uh, communities. Uh, lionfish, another one brought over. They look great in a fish tank. But when they get too big and too expensive to feed, people were letting them go. They wanted to do the right thing, right, and not kill their lionfish. Problem is, again, with their venomous spines, they have no natural predators here in the uh, Western Hemisphere. Um, so they're literally eating everything on coral reefs, destroying those super biodiverse areas um, with no end in sight. I mean, down in, I know, South Florida, Mexico, uh, some of the islands, they're, in, they're encouraging divers to kill, to literally spear these fish. They have contests who can kill the most. Uh, and it's barely putting a dent in the populations, but at least, at least it's known that they're not a good thing for the environment. see what else is worth mentioning. Ah, yes, the dreaded extinction vortex. So take a look at this. We have sort of what I like to call the death spiral leading to extinction, where a small population leads to inbreeding, genetic drift. You might remember um, founder effect, bottleneck effect. So limits genetic diversity, which leads to reduction in fitness in the population, less ability to evolve and adapt to changing conditions, which leads to higher mortality and lower reproduction, all of which in turn lowers the population size even more. And then you're back up here. And this just keeps spiraling down until unfortunately the species is extinct. All right. Always good to read these case studies, by the way. Some terminology, minimum viable population size versus the effective population size, which can be calculated. Number of males and females are your uh, data points that you plug in here. And here's a little example of that. You know, the population size of grizzly bears uh, Yellowstone was about 400, but their NE, their effective population size, was only 100, which means that that population was in more danger 
of going extinct, at least that local population, then maybe you would believe just by flying over in a helicopter and counting. All right, another good case study to read through. And it's tough. I mean, believe me, conservation biologists are always put in the middle of doing what's best for the environment while still accommodating human needs uh, and accommodating a exponentially growing human population. Um, it, it's a tough position to be in. And, and so it is a very difficult branch of science to, to work in. So this little section here talks about um, fragmented habitat versus uh, edge habitats. So I'll say fragmentation is a big deal because even if you add up all the you know, hectares of, of, of area that are, that are being preserved. Um, it's not so much about the total. You, you, you could say, oh, it's great. We have all these little isolated areas that in total equal a percentage, a huge percentage of, of land available. Um, but in reality, species can't survive like that. Uh, certain species need to have a wide range to, to move through. Um, you know, you could also imagine a, a founder effect or, or at least a genetic drift effect in a small confined area where you're going to lose genetic variability. And if these organisms aren't able to get to those other fragmented areas, you're going to lose biodiversity and maybe cause the extinction of the species anyway. To combat that, we have movement corridors, which can literally be things like this that connect one side of a road to another, uh, at least allowing species, if they're lucky enough to find this and brave enough to cross it, uh, then yeah, then, then they can utilize the whole area that's available. Typically, this road uh, would act as a, a limiting factor and, and a, a separator of habitat. So it's important to, I think, focus on what we call biodiversity hotspots. So you can see globally, it's, it's maybe no surprise that some of the more tropical areas, tropical rainforests and so forth, uh, areas are going to be where a lot of biodiversity exists and is generated. Um, definitely important to protect these areas. And so again, I think this is stuff that you guys can read through. Some marine sanctuaries, the entire Florida Keys considered a national uh, marine sanctuary. Uh, it's, it's important to limit the amount of people, what people can do in these areas, um, prevent them from taking certain species, whether it be through spear fishing, regular fishing, what have you, um, super biodiverse ecosystems, coral reefs are. Bioremediation. So living things can help in our efforts to restore certain areas. A lot of bacteria and fungi can actually take toxic materials out of soil and make it viable to grow plants, crop plants again in. So that's a concept worth looking at. And certainly adding certain species to areas can augment or make better. Uh, for instance, those nitrogen fixing bacterias can increase the amount of nitrogen in soil, making an area, again, able to grow crop plants in that wasn't beforehand. Sustainable development. So again, caught in the middle, trying to meet the needs of current and future generations while preserving habitat and species. It's a very, very difficult task. 
We had a case study. And yeah, I think this last point, you know, if we really all did have a better sense of connection to our natural environment, uh, I think it would go a long way. Um, you know, I'm certainly not perfect in the way that I live my life. I, I certainly try to do my part, um, but we all can do better. And I think the more people, especially in higher political positions that realize the necessity for a healthy, robust, biodiverse environment uh, in as much as it actually helps humans. Number one, it's the right thing to do for all those other species. But if we could really understand how keeping a, a, a biodiverse environment is beneficial to humans, maybe legislation would get passed. Maybe people would look beyond uh, the bottom line, dollars and cents wise, and do a little better to preserving the environment. So that's all I'll say about chapter 56. Uh, again, we are going to have a test on chapters 55 and 56 this Friday. So as always, please, if you have any questions about anything, uh, give me a shout through email. And um, again, the College Board is releasing information this week, which I will use to strategize what we do in the coming weeks. So everybody take care and I will see you soon.